For the United States and North Korea, with each verbal jab between respective leaders, with each thrust and parry by diplomats, with reports of more joint military exercises and hundreds of thousands of troops eyeballing one another along the world's most fortified border, I have recently pondered if the DMZ's Pan Moon Jam is the 21st century's version of Charleston in 1861. Perhaps a stretch, perhaps not. But with that reflection, we now look back over time's shoulder. This is Flashpoint, 1861. The last five letters of history spell story, and that's exactly how history should be taught. Numbers and dates have no soul. Such presentations fall flat, for history is alive and relevant. Welcome to Threads from the National Tapestry, stories from the American Civil War. This series will feature events and people from that period and will strive to make you feel as if you were there to show that history is indeed a story. The man who unintentionally decided just where the Civil War would begin arrived in Charleston in late November of 1860, some two weeks after Abraham Lincoln's election and some four weeks before South Carolina seceded. Kentucky native Major Robert Anderson came to Charleston to take command of Fort Moultrie, Fort Sumter, and Castle Pinckney, all federal installations within Charleston Harbor. He was handpicked by President James Buchanan, Secretary of War, Virginian John B. Floyd, who wanted someone there in command with Southern roots. His choice of Anderson was approved by another Virginian, 74-year-old Winfield Scott, the General-in-Chief of the United States Army. Unlike Floyd, he was a strong Unionist and certain that Anderson's loyalty was ironclad. The five-foot, eight-inch, slope-shouldered Anderson had served as a Mexican War aide to Scott. There, he had been remarkably unremarkable, but his devotion to duty was impressive. It is interesting to note that a few years before, Anderson mustered into service a tall, lanky volunteer for the Black Hawk War. Now, that man was his commander-in-chief, Abraham Lincoln. Winfield Scott knew Anderson was a man guided by the Ten Commandments, the Constitution, and United States Army regulations. His wife, Eliza, was a Georgian. The father of four, he was a slave owner, and Floyd reasoned Anderson would fall in line with his kind when the dominoes began to fall. In a touch of irony, Anderson's father, Captain Richard Anderson commanded Fort Moultrie, but that was during the War for Independence. In 1780, that Anderson surrendered the installation to the British. His son did not wish to share his father's fate. Upon his arrival, Anderson immediately worried about his ability to defend himself. Moultrie's location was fine, but vulnerable to a land attack from the rear. To add to his woes, he had only 60 United States regular army soldiers to defend Fort Moultrie's 1,500 feet of works. Castle Pinckney, another fort he was to defend, was not only poorly armed, it was unmanned. And then there was a squat, unfinished piece of masonry out on a man-made island some 3.3 miles from the southern city. With the foundation of New England granite, Fort Sumter, though unfinished, had walls that rose 50 feet. Inside, there were 66 cannon, but only 15 were mounted. Although only 80% completed, Anderson knew that if conditions deteriorated, he could defend Sumter, and the Kentuckian fully expected South Carolina to secede and to strike Fort Moultrie. That feeling led him to bombard Washington City with urgent reports of supply shortages and requests for firm, clearly worded orders and more men. However, in the nation's capital, Secretary of War Floyd did not mention Anderson's appeals to General-in-Chief Scott. Indeed, on December the 1st, 1860, Secretary Floyd informed Anderson that since he anticipated no attacks— 
Reinforcements were unnecessary. Yet Floyd did allow some wiggle room. On his orders, Major Don Carlos Buell arrived in Charleston December the 9th and relayed permission that Anderson could move his command should he believe he was about to be attacked. And no question, South Carolina troops planned to do just that. As early as November the 12th, South Carolina had 20 militiamen protecting the federal arsenal in Charleston. Protect meant denying its arms and ammunition to its rightful owners. After South Carolina left the Union on December the 20th, secessionists walked up and down Fort Moultrie's boundary day and night. Anderson's force was so small that his officers and men were driven to exhaustion, trying simply to match the hours put in by the South Carolina militia. Two weary officers, in fact, had their wives take their shifts. Anderson believed his duty was to avoid confrontation if honor permitted. If not, he would protect his post. He knew he could not defend Moultrie, but believed in Fort Sumter he could, and so decided to move on Christmas night, but rain postponed their transfer to the next evening. All through the night of December the 26th, 27th, men in blue, quietly, secretly, ferried their gear and force into unfinished Sumter. Around noon on Thursday the 27th, Charlestonians watched with great irritation the raising of the stars and stripes over Fort Sumter. Seething with anger, South Carolina immediately seized Fort Moultrie, the federal arsenal in Charleston, the post office, and the customs house. In their minds, the middle of the night move to Fort Sumter was hostile. Anderson, taken aback by this, did not intend to anger anyone. In his mind, he simply changed his base to prevent, or at least delay, an armed uprising. What he did not realize was that he had made Fort Sumter a symbol for two diametrically opposed ideologies. In other words, Fort Sumter became a lightning rod. It was federal property from which the United States could not retreat. To South Carolinians, it was a piece of property that no self-declared sovereign state could possibly allow a foreign power to control. In Washington City and the executive mansion, confusion reigned. A vacillating James Buchanan believed it was the responsibility of Congress to act. He groaned, My God, are calamities never to come singly? It seemed not, for on December the 28th, three South Carolina commissioners called on him. They demanded Anderson's evacuation or the purchase of Fort Sumter. Incredibly, Buchanan received them, essentially diplomatic recognition of the sovereign state of South Carolina. Despite receiving them, the lame duck president made no commitments. He wanted to confer with his cabinet, which was in the throes of chaos as well. Angry with two Southern cabinet members, Floyd of Virginia and Interior Secretary Jacob Thompson of Louisiana, Buchanan finally showed a little backbone. The next day, he kept South Carolina commissioners at arm's length. But to one, he blurted, You don't give me time to say my prayers. I always say my prayers when required to act upon any great state affair. Finally, he made a decision. He ordered Anderson not to evacuate Fort Sumter, and then the kicker. Fort Sumter would be held against hostile acts from whatever quarter they may come. His decision created a new concern. Anderson was running out of supplies. An expedition would have to be made. Rather than use a man of war, Winfield Scott arranged for the renting of a merchant vessel, the Star of the West which was to leave from New York with three months' worth of supplies and a secret cargo of 200 troops who were ordered to stay below deck when they approached Charleston Harbor. The Star of the West left in the middle of the night, January 5, 1861. Despite all the secrecy, two days after the ship sailed, rumors appeared in the New York press and in Washington City. On January the 8th, Interior Secretary Thompson notified South Carolina of the relief mission, then resigned his post. 
By telegraph, Texas Senator Louis T. Wigfall warned South Carolina Governor Francis Pickens that the supply vessel could be expected at any hour. Incredibly, Anderson had no idea a relief mission was even on the way. He also was unaware that if the vessel was fired upon, he had permission to fire back. That information had unbelievably been sent not by courier, but by regular mail. Around 6 a.m. on Wednesday, January the 9th, Sumter's garrison jolted when they heard cannon fire out in the harbor. The Star of the West had been spotted by South Carolina batteries. Citadel Cadet G.E. Hainsworth jerked the lanyard on his cannon gun number one. The warning shot screamed across the vessel's bow, arguably the first shot fired in the American Civil War. Inside Sumter, Anderson could not decide what to do. Meanwhile, guns from occupied Fort Moultrie joined in. Anderson paced the parapet, but unaware of specific orders from Washington, he refused to return fire, which incensed his men. The Star of the West eventually turned about and headed back out into the open Atlantic. A frustrated and humiliated Anderson demanded an explanation from South Carolina Governor Pickens and threatened to use his guns to close the harbor unless Pickens apologized. The governor not only refused to do so, but added, I would be willing to appeal to the God of battles, if need be, to cover the state with ruin, conflagration, and blood rather than submit. Rage was on the wind, and the Charleston Mercury's fire-eating editor, Robert Barnwell Rett, fueled it when he wrote, We would not exchange or recall that blow for millions. It has wiped out a half-century of scorn and outrage. In upstate New York, the Albany, Atlas, and Argus countered. The authority and dignity of the government must be vindicated at every hazard. Southern action and northern reaction had the effect of uniting secessionists in the Deep South. Almost at once, Mississippi joined South Carolina in secession. The next day, Florida. A day later, Alabama. On January 19th, Georgia seceded. A week later, Louisiana acted, and on February the 1st, Texas left the fold. In each of the seven seceded states, almost all federal installations were either occupied or surrendered. On the 18th of February, Jefferson Davis took the oath of office, and as president of the Confederacy made it clear he hoped for a peaceable separation. Quite honestly, there were those in the North who felt the same way. Let the erring sisters go in peace. On March the 4th, Abraham Lincoln became the 16th President of the United States, and after only one day in office, he was hit between the eyes with crisis. On the 5th, a letter arrived from Anderson, which informed the new president that he and his men were running out of supplies. Lincoln sought advice. Should he reinforce and or resupply Fort Sumter? He turned to his recently appointed cabinet. Their counsel was more alarming than informative. Postmaster General Montgomery Blair was the only one who wanted Anderson to hold out. The majority favored appeasement. They thought giving in might buy time, allowing cooler heads to prevail. On his own, Lincoln ordered agents to Charleston to judge on site whether to and how an expedition might get through. Meanwhile, three Confederate commissioners arrived in Washington City to discuss the formal opening of foreign relations. Those three met with Supreme Court Justice John A. Campbell of Alabama, who was about to resign, and he acted on behalf of the Confederacy. To further muddy the waters, on March 15th, Lincoln's Secretary of State, William Seward, without any authorization, told Campbell that Sumter would indeed be evacuated within three days. He relayed that news, and the infant Confederacy believed their new nation had won its first battle without ever firing a shot. Yet, six days went by, and the Stars and Stripes still flew over Sumter. On the 29th, 
After receiving word from his agents in Charleston, the 16th president made a fateful decision. He ordered the reinforcement and resupply of Sumter as soon as possible. Three days later, on April the 1st, appropriately April Fool's Day, an embarrassed and squirming Seward, caught in political and personal duplicity, tried to salvage the damage he had wrought. By doing so, he made things worse. In a letter to Lincoln, he suggested the United States should provoke war with either Spain or France. If done, he believed the South would return to the Union and unite once again against a common enemy. The president ignored Seward's advice. The relief expedition left Washington April the 4th. The man in charge of the expedition, Gustavus V. Fox, was ordered to send ashore only supplies. He had troops, but was not to unload them unless attacked or interfered with. For transparency, on the 6th, Lincoln then sent a messenger to South Carolina Governor Pickens, which informed him of the strictly limited mission and stressed its peaceful intent. But from the get-go, Pickens suspected intrigue, and two days later passed along that suspicion to President Jefferson Davis in Montgomery, Alabama, and the Confederate commander in Charleston Harbor, Brigadier General P.G.T. Beauregard. Ironically, When Beauregard was at West Point in the late 1830s, his artillery instructor and postgraduate friend was none other than Robert Anderson. Now that friend was his enemy. Since Beauregard's arrival, he had been busy, and by early April he had a ring of artillery fire which encircled Fort Sumter. To man those 46 guns, he had some 6,000 men of all ages in training. Beauregard was ready, and so was the Confederate government in Montgomery. Regardless of Lincoln's reassurances, Confederate officials were tired of waiting. Davis convened his cabinet on Tuesday, April the 9th, and while they met up in Washington City, Abraham Lincoln had at least fulfilled an inaugural promise. If there was going to be a first shot, the Confederacy would fire it. Jefferson Davis did not want that shot fired any more than Lincoln did. Yet after months of delay and anxiety, he had been backed into a corner. Indeed, one of his friends warned, Unless you sprinkle blood in the face of the southern people, they will be back in the old Union in less than ten days. Mr. Lincoln had made his fateful decision to resupply and reinforce Sumter back on March 29th. Now Jefferson Davis and his cabinet made theirs. With only one dissenting vote, P.G.T. Beauregard was given permission to open fire with his batteries. In a curious twist, the only no vote came from Georgia fire eater Robert Toombs, who chilled the room with this assessment. Mr. President, the firing upon that fort will inaugurate a civil war greater than any the world has yet seen. On Wednesday, April the 10th, Confederate Secretary of War Leroy Walker telegraphed Beauregard, Under no circumstances are you to allow provisions to be sent to Fort Sumter. You are to demand the immediate evacuation of Fort Sumter, and if refused for any reason, proceed in such manner as you may determine to reduce it. That night in Charleston, parades snaked through the streets. Drums rolled, and excited horses with equally excited riders clattered up and down cobblestone streets. Bonfires cast brilliant light and eerie shadows, and all through the night, fiery, war-induced hysteria. Moderation was dead. Fueling that mood, visiting Virginia secessionist Roger Pryor moved to the balcony of his hotel, and made an impromptu speech to a fevered South Carolina crowd down in the street below. I thank you especially that you have at last annihilated this accursed union, reeking with corruption and insolent with excess of tyranny. Not only is it gone, but gone forever. As sure as tomorrow's sun will rise upon us, just so sure will old Virginia be a member of the Southern Confederacy. And I will tell your governor... 
What will put her in the Southern Confederacy in less than an hour by a Shrewsbury clock? Strike a blow. The very moment that blood is shed, old Virginia will make common cause with her sisters of the South. The next day was Thursday, April the 11th, the final day of peace. In Charleston, it dawned warm and cloudy. South Carolina's James Chestnut was called to Beauregard's headquarters. Given a written surrender ultimatum, he was to deliver it to Major Robert Anderson. Accompanied by Captain Stephen D. Lee and Colonel James A. Chisholm, Chestnut was rowed out to Fort Sumter, where, received, he presented the communication to Sumter's beleaguered commander. Anderson withdrew to consult with his officers. All rejected the notion of surrender. Writing out his response, Anderson handed it to Chestnut, then walked the Confederate party to the wharf. It was there he asked, Will General Beauregard open his batteries without further notice to me? I think not, replied the South Carolinian. Then Chestnut added, No, I can say to you that he will not without further notice. Anderson nodded, and seemingly aware of where all this was headed, quietly said, If you do not batter us to pieces, we shall be starved out in a few days. That jarring admission was reported to Beauregard once Chestnut returned, and that intel was telegraphed to Confederate Secretary of War Walker. It meant that, quite possibly, Sumter might be taken without firing a shot. Simply wait until they run out of provisions. Walker's reply came back. If Anderson would state the time and date when he would evacuate, Beauregard could hold his fire. Another message to Anderson was composed, and once again Chestnut was sent to deliver it. The South Carolinian, according to Anderson's response, was empowered by Beauregard to act on the spot. Just before 1 a.m. on Friday, April the 12th, Chestnut was rowed once again to Sumter, where he delivered his message. Anderson, once again, conferred with his officers. They debated for over two hours, so long that Chestnut thought they were stalling. He interrupted their discussion and required an answer. It came shortly after 3 a.m. Anderson would evacuate on April the 15th, holding his fire unless fired upon, or unless he detected some act of hostility that would endanger the fort. He went on. His agreement to hold his fire might be altered if he received instructions from his government or if he received additional supplies. To Chestnut, too many conditions. Therefore, on Beauregard's authority, he penned, By the authority of Brigadier General Beauregard, commanding the provisional forces of the Confederate States, we have the honor to notify you that he will open the fire of his batteries on Fort Sumter in one hour from this time. It was 3.30 a.m. Back on the wharf, Chestnut and Major Anderson shook hands, and the Kentuckian said, If we never meet in this world again, God grant that we may meet in the next. As the Confederate Party was rowed back to nearby Confederate-held Fort Johnson, the bells in St. Michael's tolled 4 a.m. Once Chestnut arrived, he turned to Captain George S. James and asked him to prepare to fire a signal shell. James complied. The Confederate ring of fire made ready. Inside the unfinished garrison and symbol of federal authority, no finer prose captures the moment better than that of popular historian Bruce Catton, who wrote, In the black hours of early morning, the United States officers stood on the parapet atop Fort Sumter and looked off into the darkness toward the place where they knew the nearest guns had been planted. The candle flame was guttering out fast, and it was very close to the socket. But as long as it continued to flicker, the America of the old days still lived.
The America that was cemented to a heritage from the past, with a dream born of pride and careless waste of lazy beauty and cruelty, its face turned away from the future. That dream was about to die the moment its impassioned defenders pulled on the lanyard of one of the surrounding cannon. And at long last, at 4.30 in the morning, there was a quick flash, like heat lightning, off beyond the unseen marshland, and a sullen red spark climbed up the black sky, seemed to hang motionless for a final instant directly overhead, and then came plunging down to explode in great light and rocking sound that would reverberate across the land and mark an end and a beginning. Virginia secessionist Roger Pryor had been offered the honor to fire the opening shot, but said afterwards, I could not fire the first gun of the war. Instead, when Captain James gave the order, it was Lieutenant Henry S. Farley who jerked the lanyard, and it was a shot that plunged 31 million Americans into the abyss of civil war. In the American Civil War, it was a conflict fought with rifled muskets and artillery and weapons that, at the time, seemed impossible, seemed inhumane. Mines, a submarine, ironclads, repeating weapons. Today, we have weapons that assure horrific consequences. Like the rest of the world, we'll watch, wait, and hope that bravado might succumb to brotherhood and saber-rattling might give way to peaceful solution. For further reading about the days and events around Fort Sumter, may I please recommend Days of Defiance, Sumter, Secession, and the Coming of the Civil War by Maury Klein. I suggest Klein's work simply because it chronicles not only the events around Fort Sumter, but the building to the particular events and the consequences thereafter. And, which always captures my ear, it is written so well and the prose conducts a story. In that respect, I highly recommend Days of Defiance, Sumter, Secession, and the Coming of the Civil War. This is Fred Kiger. Thank you for listening.